Now, I've already talked about this several times, is that I'm just not that excited for WrestleMania 32. And I know I'm not the only one by any stretch of the imagination. And I find it ironic, as I go back and look, a year ago, or close to it, I was incredibly excited about the possibility of what could happen and what was shaping up for WrestleMania 32. I'm like, oh my God, you're going into AT&T Stadium, that shrine to Jerry Jones' ego. You're going to put 100,000, 105,000 people into that venue. You could do freaking Triple H versus The Rock. You might have Stephanie McMahon, Ronda Rousey in some capacity. You might have The Undertaker versus Sting or Taker versus John Cena. You might have a couple other big matches in there. This show looked like it could be huge. It could be special. It could be a real true blockbuster. But it's funny now, as the weeks have went by and the months have rolled on, now we get to that moment in hand. It is so close we can taste it. WrestleMania 32 is almost here. And for a lot of us, it's shaping up like it's going to taste like a shit sandwich. And that's just the truth of the matter. And who could blame anyone for thinking that way? Because the storytelling has been atrocious and the build in general has just been incredibly piss poor for what would seemingly be such a big and important show. Not just the biggest show of the year, mind you, because it's WrestleMania, but such a huge and seminally important show when you're talking about trying to set an indoor North American attendance record. You're trying to put over 100,000 people into AT&T Stadium. And you look at it and you say, this is the best you could do in terms of this. This is the best you could do in terms of effort level, in terms of storytelling. I mean, yeah, it doesn't look good. But you know, sometimes the trick of being a WWE fan, and sometimes, frankly, the trick of just being a wrestling fan in general, is that you always have that throughout all of the periods of pessimism and negativity and cynicism, and a lot of it right now, frankly, justified, let's face it. There's still that lingering, inevitable hope and positivity that sits somewhere deep, deep down in the recesses of the cockles of your heart and your soul that you believe somehow, some way, it's going to go well, even if you know it's not. Somehow, some way, this company will pull it off, even though you don't think they will. Somehow, some way, because it's WrestleMania, something is going to happen. There's going to be that WrestleMania moment. There's going to be that WrestleMania magic that ultimately sucks you in and helps you to enjoy the event and make it a good WrestleMania to watch. And, you know, as I sit here and I look at it more and more, like, you know, I've said my enough about pessimism and negativity and cynicism over the past several weeks and months in the lead-up to this show. Let's take a little bit of a different look and a little bit of a different approach here, a bit of a 180, and talk about WrestleMania 32 in a somewhat positive light, as challenging as this may be, and talk about how WrestleMania 32 could be good and actually surprisingly good and be one of those shows that it could, when all is said and done, feel like it was justified to be inside of an venue, an event, an arena where you drew over 100,000 people. I know it seems crazy, but just hear me out here for a couple of moments and I'll explain. You know, when we're talking about WrestleMania, you know, let's look at the fact that one thing that could really help the show is the fact that you're going to be at AT&T Stadium. It's going to feel big. I mean, it's going to feel huge. And you know the WWE is going to try and sell you on that idea all night come WrestleMania. You know, you're talking about 100,000 plus people potentially at this event. You know, if that crowd gets engaged in any way, if that crowd gets excited in any way, if that crowd gets emotionally invested in the night, in the event, even in one particular match or one particular moment, I mean, that could do so much to carry over the energy to the viewing audience at home that could really make this night feel like something special. It could potentially even mask some of the deficiencies within the show, in particular the build-up to the actual show. You know, even when you talk about the Super Bowl, some years there are a compelling matchups, some years there are not. But when you know it is a Super Bowl game and you know there are all these things at stake and all these things that roll into it, at the end of the day, it still feels like a Super Bowl, even if the results on the field don't always feel like it was Super Bowl worthy. Some years are better than others. But it will still ultimately feel like a Super Bowl. And when you tune in or you go there live and you know there's 100,000 plus people potentially at AT&T Stadium for WrestleMania 32, it is instantly going to feel like WrestleMania. Then you throw in the fact that you have some of the goodwill that comes with the Hall of Fame class and people like Sting 
and the Godfather and the big boss man and the fabulous Freebirds being inducted. You know, seeing those legends, that's always a part of the WrestleMania weekend. So some of that goodwill actually starts out the night before the major show itself. It's a weekend. It's an event. And that Hall of Fame night can really do a lot to really set the table well for WrestleMania 32. And, you know, when you see people like Sting and The Godfather, and God, who knows what the hell type of entrances they might have for their reveal at the show itself, you know, that could be something that helps. But when you look outside of that, you know, you're talking about a show where it looks like all titles are actually going to be defended. How many years have we talked about where the IC title wasn't defended at WrestleMania or this title wasn't defended at WrestleMania or the tag titles were always defended on the freaking pre-show? There is at least a chance, an opportunity here for all of the title matches to be on the main WrestleMania card. Now, you would think if one of them ended up getting dropped off, it would be the U.S. title, but at least that title would still be defended in some way, shape, or form at the WrestleMania event, even if it was on the pre-show. That is a step up. That is a positive. You also look at it, too. They're throwing multiple extreme stipulations at this event. It is very, very hard to have a crappy street fight. It is very, very hard to have a crappy Hell in a Cell match. It is very, very hard to have a crappy ladder match. Because of the boundaries you could push, because of the things that you could do, because of the envelope that you could push, because of all of these spots and crazy bumps and shit that you could pull off, and piece together and kind of ram in there. You know, when you think about a Hell in a Cell match, a street fight, and a ladder match all being on the main WrestleMania card, you know, that will definitely help the feeling of the show because it is going to be very unlikely that one out of those three matches, let alone two of them or all three of them, are going to get crapped on. Because if anything, we're going to get sucked in by all the spots, by all the extreme stipulations, and all the extreme shit done during these matches that these matches are going to get a pass and they, if anything, are going to be overrated as opposed to being underrated. We'll think of them as being better than maybe they actually are. You know, you also look at this too from a standpoint of that next generation talking about the WWE with all of these guys like Cena and Orton and so on and so forth being out of the way. It's a huge platform, a huge opportunity for those guys that could help carry the company potentially for the next few years like Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose. Um, and Kevin Owens, some of you might throw in there a Sami Zayn. You might throw in there the Divas, especially when you talk about Charlotte and Becky Lynch and Sasha Banks. You could be talking about the Usos. You could be talking about the New Day, somebody like Kalisto. You know, there is opportunity here with some of these big names not being around, some of these big names being out with injury, some of these big names not being booked for the event, for this next generation to step up and take ownership of this event, to take ownership of this show, to take ownership of this company for the future. And with some of these guys being able to be spotlighted, in particular somebody like a Dean Ambrose in a big spot against somebody like a Brock Lesnar, you know, that could be something that is very good for the company going forward. This could potentially turn out to be a memorable show because it could be a pivotal night in the careers of several of these newer and younger performers in the WWE, the people that we are looking to potentially to carry the company for the next three, five, seven to even ten years. You know, not only that, you still have some pretty solid star power. I know we're focusing on the people that aren't necessarily there or aren't necessarily wrestling, the people like the John Cena's, the people like the Randy Orton's of the world. You know, and you talk about those type of guys, the fact that Sting's going to the Hall of Fame, but Sting's not going to be wrestling. But let's face it, there is still star power involved here. You've still got The Undertaker at WrestleMania in a featured match. You know, that's always been one of the big things for Mania in recent years. You built around a match involving the world championship, and you built around a match involving The Undertaker. Usually, it was about defending the street. And it wasn't always necessarily in that order. Sometimes you built up the Taker match more. You've still got Taker. He's still a big deal. Now you throw Shane McMahon into the mix, a star from the past, a lot of name recognition. A lot of people are happy to see Shane McMahon back. He's there. When's the last time he wrestled at a WrestleMania? You've got Vince McMahon, you would have to think, is going to be involved in the show in some way, shape, or form. When it comes to stars in the WWE, it does not get bigger than Vincent K. McMahon, even if it doesn't involve him necessarily being an in-ring competitor at the event. You've still got Brock Lesnar your special attraction, who is in a featured match. You've got God himself, the 14-time world champion, Triple H. He's defending the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. 
You know, we could sit there and talk about a lack of perceived star power, but the fact is, if you look closer, there is still star power. In fact, there is plenty of star power, especially when you throw in the fact that you know that there are going to be other names that can make appearances, other names that are going to get involved in this show in somehow way, shape, or form, besides just the Hall of Fame class. You know The Rock is booked somehow. Could it just be another repetitive promo segment like he's done the past couple of years? Perhaps. But maybe he gets involved in the match. Maybe he actually does something that is a surprise. But you've still got that matzo ball of the rock out there that you can interject into the show at some point in time that's going to potentially help. You've got that matzo ball of Stone Cold Steve Austin. You know he's going to be there. And you know you're in Texas, the Texas rattlesnake. You get him involved, and especially when you're talking about Shane McMahon and The Undertaker, Hell in a Cell, there's an opportunity right there to involve the Texas rattlesnake. That would be a major significant surprise. That would be something that would really help pump up the level and the feeling of the show even more than it maybe should be, similar to how when you saw Degeneration X and the New World Order battling out last year during the Sting Triple H match at 31. You know HBK could potentially be involved in some way, shape, or form. As much as it can be for WWE, it is still going to be all hands on deck. So you've got The Rock, you know is going to be there in some capacity. You know that Steve Austin is going to be there in some capacity, and you would believe that HBK is going to be there in some capacity. So you've still got some star power. Not a lot of young star power, but star power nonetheless. This WrestleMania doesn't have to take as much as a backseat in terms of star power as many people want to make you out to think and want to make you to believe. It just doesn't. There's still some big names involved in this show. Some big names that any other year you build a WrestleMania around guys like Taker and Triple H and Brock Lesnar. You feel like you're in a pretty good place if we're being honest. And then you look at the fact of the actual match card itself. Not only are all the titles being defended, not only do you have some star power, and some good star power at that, not only do you have some guys from that next generation being featured in some potentially big spots, the extreme stipulations of the matches and everything else, you just look at the actual match card. You know, you've got a seven-man match for the IC title. You would have to think they're going to crash test dummy themselves into a good shot, in a good show. You would think. Then you've got that Divas title match. A real spotlight opportunity for Charlotte and Sasha Banks and Becky Lynch. And we're talking about star power. You're still going to have Ric Flair out there ringside with his daughter, Charlotte. That helps elevate the profile of that Divas match exponentially just with him standing out there. And then if you potentially throw a snoop out there, my goodness, you want to talk about star power. But that Divas match could be a really important match for that Divas division and for that company going forward. This is a huge spot and a huge opportunity for these three ladies, ladies to really go out there and kick some ass and really do something positive. You want to talk about all that lip service paid to Divas Revolution, here's a chance to put up or shut up. Here is that moment in time. You know, you look at a match like Chris Jericho versus AJ Styles. Yes, they've already done it three times. Yes, there isn't quite that same appeal there because it doesn't have that freshness of feeling of what would happen or what would ever go on if these two wrestled each other at Mania. It doesn't have that same dream match feel. But it could still produce like that traditional mid-card match where there's no extreme bullshit, there's no titles on the line. It's just one guy versus the other who is better. This match still has some of the elements of that, and you would think already with some of the practice that they've had, and maybe that was the whole decision-making process behind this, now, these guys have worked several times together one-on-one. -on -one. They should have everything ironed out. You can give these guys 20 minutes and let Chris Jericho and AJ Styles somewhere early on in the show go kick some fucking ass. And then you look at the three major matches, if you will, the three featured title matches, or not title matches, but the three featured marquee main event matches. You've got a street fight involving Brock Lesnar and Dean Ambrose. We know how Brock Lesnar matches already feel different. Now when you basically are saying he could do any fucking thing in the world he wants, that's what makes his matches really interesting and compelling. And now you put a Dean Ambrose in a situation where he's best suited, where you don't have to worry about the technical aspects of it. You don't have to worry about the real storytelling in terms of we're going to grapple and we're going to hold each other like man, wrestling man. 
We're going to sit there and just beat the ever-loving tar fucking shit out of each other. We're going to push it to all types of different boundaries. And you want to talk about a lunatic fringe, here is a chance to establish him as clearly living on the lunatic fringe. That match could potentially reek of all different types of awesomeness in theory, especially with Ambrose going over Lesnar in a productive, proper way at the end of the match. And even when you get to the WWE World Heavyweight Championship, you know, everybody could crap on Roman Reigns and the thought of him winning it. But let's face it, his performance was good at WrestleMania 31. For all the people that want to just sit there and talk about, oh, he's Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns looks stupid. You know, it took two to tango. And it wasn't just about Rollins cashing in at the end of the night, walking out champion. That was a buildup to that moment. That was the part, that was the cherry on the top of what I still feel was a relatively forgettable show. That was the thing that really topped it off nicely was that main event match and the finish that went down. Roman Reigns can deliver the goods better than some people want to give him credit for. And he's stepping into the ring with God. When it comes to reliable, sure hands and delivering you a solid effort and a solid performance at WrestleMania, I'm going to Hunter just as likely as I would a Triple H or, or excuse me, a freaking Shawn Michaels or a Taker or many other people or anybody in the goddamn company's history. Triple H has had a lot of really good WrestleMania matches over the years. And I'm going to put my faith in God that he can get the job done and do the right thing come WrestleMania 32. And if they could get by with some of the adult fans booing, but a lot of the ladies cheering and the kids cheering, where it kind of balances itself out and sounds like a kind of ambivalent, eh? That is a huge victory. And I think with the dynamics that are in place, potentially, once these two get in the ring and the style that they can work, I think this match could potentially pleasantly surprise a lot of people. And then you get that Hell in a Cell match with The Undertaker and Shane McMahon. You know, there's a part of me that looks at it as a lose-lose situation, because I think it is. But then you also know that you're talking about The Undertaker. This is WrestleMania. More often than not, you can count on The Undertaker to deliver the goods, come a WrestleMania spot come a WrestleMania match. Now, you know Shane McMahon isn't going to sit there and freaking bore you to death with these five-star technical moves. That's not Shane McMahon's game. He's going to be willing to put his body on the line and do whatever the fuck he takes. And again, talking about crash test dummy shit with the element of maybe Vince is involved, maybe Austin is involved, maybe The Rock's involved here, maybe this asshole's involved here. You know, that has a, is a match that could potentially end up closing out the night. That is a match that could pleasantly surprise and really deliver. So when you look at the entirety of this event, there are still other factors that are going to have to play here. Match placement and flow is going to have to be incredibly, incredibly important. You're going to have to space out those three marquee matches appropriately. You really, really are. You're going to have to sit there and probably put Ambrose and Lesnar fourth on the card. You may have to put Ambrose and, or excuse me, Triple H and Reigns uh, second to last on the card. And then it's got to be the Hell in a Cell last. Or you may even have to do Reigns and Triple H third from last. Or you may have to do the Hell in a Cell in the middle of the show, even though you would think that that would be too important and had too much built up into it to mid-card. You know, card placement is going to be very important. You start off with the IC title ladder match. Then maybe you throw in there Jericho and Styles right afterwards to get you slowed down. You know, time management is going to be very important. The past few years, the WWE has had a huge problem in terms of rushing through hour number one, and then they really get bogged down and have to slow themselves down and get to a match that really slows them down. So that card placement, that flow is going to be incredibly, incredibly important. But the potential is there. For all the shit we're talking about, the buildup to this event, and all the shit we're talking about this card, I think if you look deep down within yourselves, even if you don't want to admit it, there's still a chance. There is a possibility. And I think it's a more realistic possibility than some of us, maybe myself included, want to give this company that WrestleMania 32 could be good. And it actually could be really good, especially as a self-contained entity within that one night in terms of actual show quality. There is a chance. But it's really going to come down to the WWE being able to engage that 100,000 plus people early on in the night and being able to keep them engaged throughout the course of the night, being able to keep a steady flow where the match card structure makes a lot of sense and that when it comes time for those critical decisions of who goes over, how, and when, that they execute and they get the job done. And if they do that, a lot of people could be coming onto YouTube and onto social media come Sunday night 
preparing themselves to shit all over the show and finding themselves talking about how it far exceeded their expectation they were pleasantly surprised at how, how good it is. And if I had to make a bold prediction at this point, a bold prediction, that could very well potentially be what I'm doing come Sunday night after WrestleMania 32. Coming on here and still doing my nitpicking that I'm going to do, still pointing out the things that were wrong that needed to be pointed out, but overall having a sense and a feeling that this show was a lot better than maybe other people give it credit for and was a lot better than I thought it was ever going to be. Believe in the power of positivity and hope because the hope is still alive, people!